my goodness. How are you all? I am very excited to see you. I appreciate that the front row is all checking their email, like apparently you're the managers. Everyone in the back is trying to build their software, but I can see you deleting emails like a boss. So good job doing that. My, one of my buddies just looked down and deleted another email when I said that. Um, so this is an interesting talk. This is an experiment that they let me do because I think that there's a bunch of cool little things that maybe aren't keynote ready or maybe not even fun enough or interesting enough to put in any talk, but what if we put a parade of all the developer things, all the fun little things. It might be a little small feature that was added to Visual Studio 2019 that made me smile. It might be an experiment. I've got a couple of experiments that I'm going to show you that we don't know if we're going to ship. I honestly don't know if it's a good idea. I will measure those things based on your cheering. Uh, and if I show you a demo and there's silence, well, you've just killed a product, so feel good about, <laughs> feel good about that, okay? So we, we've already heard before in the other talks that life runs on code. For me, it's even more important because not only is it things like your, your car or your traffic system or the space shuttle or your artificial pancreas or uh, a little robot that runs around your house, what was that? Um, my artificial pancreas keeps me alive. It runs in Azure, and I've got it in my pocket, and I've been, I've been looping on an open source artificial pancreas for over three years. So for me, life really does run on code, and it really gets me excited when I start thinking about the power that code has to influence all the things in our digital life, whether it be your smart home and being able to go and talk to a smart system at home, uh, whether it be things like connected retail that we're starting to see more and more scenarios, or the future of things like manufacturing, digital factories, smart cities, and more. Life runs on code and also tacos. I'm going to try to make as many taco-related demos as possible in this talk. Uh, and uh, the fact that, of course, I'm here from Portland working remotely in uh, Seattle right now means that I get to expense all of my tacos. And because I'm on an expense account, it's uh, double meat, free double meat, because Microsoft has to pay for it. <laughs> Pretty exciting. I've had tacos morning, noon, and night. It's a really great time to be a .NET developer. We talked about this a little bit in our talk with Scott Hunter, but this idea that I can do stuff not just in Azure, uh, not just Azure Functions, Azure Signal R services. I can do things anywhere in Azure. .NET pervades all around Azure. I get new abilities as a developer every time a new Azure service comes out. That makes me really happy. A new service comes out and I go, oh, I can use that. It's like a new tool for my toolbox and I can put it in my pocket and I've got Cosmos DB, Azure SQL, Cognitive Services. So I wanted to see how many fun things we could do and how many fun things we could break with .NET. Let's go look at a few fun things that I've been playing with. I'm going to run around here in uh, Visual Studio for just a second. This is Visual Studio 2019. I've got my uh, Visual Studio. This is actually my podcast website. little advertising moment here. I've actually got a podcast you may have checked out. It's called Hansel Minutes. And it's really fun. And the website's actually written in ASP.NET Core and built with Visual Studio 2019 and hosted on Azure. And there's been hundreds and hundreds of shows of lovely people like you. I would encourage you to check the show out. What's fun about having a website that you keep up 24-7, of course, is that you get to learn about all this kind of code. I like trying new things. I'm using unit testing. I'm using headless Selenium testing. I get to go and run code cleanup and try new features in Visual Studio. Uh, with the actual source code of what I'm working on. This here is code cleanup that we saw a little bit about, but I want to talk more in adv uh, more ad advanced than we did in the keynote. If I go here to configure code cleanup, I can actually set up different profiles and I can describe the features that I care about that are either editor features like white space and tabs and things like that, or language specific features. And that editor config file gets checked in to source code. It's, a, it's an artifact that you actually care about and I can go and change how this behaves, plug it into an editor.config, and it works not only in Visual Studio 2019, but also Visual Studio Code, which of course runs everywhere on Mac and on Linux and on Windows, which means that then Code Cleanup will use these things, and I can have different profiles. So I can have my, my work things, and I can have my personal things, and describe how I want my code. So if work wants spaces, we do that, and if our home wants tabs, we can do that. And it's really great that that's all built into Visual Studio. One of the things that I think is really interesting 
is this extension and the rich extensibility model that we've got in 2019. I've actually put in a thing here called WAC WAC Terminal. This is one of the extensions. There's thousands of great extensions that you can get to Visual Studio 2019. Wouldn't it be nice to have an integrated terminal inside of Visual Studio 2019? You can have that now with an extension from the marketplace. Maybe if you give them feedback that you think that's fun and important, they might put that in, uh, in Visual Studio proper, which would be kind of cool. By the way, that right there, that's my blood sugar. True story. I, I'm glad you're laughing at my pain. Thank you for laughing at <laughs> And then that's my Git prompt, which is really fun. So I've got my main branch and I've got my blood sugar all in that prompt integrated into Visual Studio. You wouldn't be able to do something like that unless you had a really extensible system. And having an extensible prompt, having that prompt inside Visual Studio and then being able to have extension in Visual Studio makes me very happy. Another thing I wanted to point out was what was going on up here in the search bar. I can search Visual Studio. So I do something like fonts. Look at this as I type. Go and say fonts, go right to it. So it's not tools, options, environment, da, 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 da. And I can go and search for other stuff, add a new WinForms item, add new templates. And I can even go and search online for those things. I can search within NuGet itself. That search dialog, you should spend more time in there. Now, sometimes people think when you learn Visual Studio, you have to learn all the hotkeys. I don't learn all the hotkeys. I only know like three. I know Control Q, which gets me up into the search box there. I know Control Comma, which gets me the go anywhere, navigate anywhere kind of action there. Uh, I know Dot. And then I know, uh, of course, the crucial Windows Dot, which brings up the emoji picker which has apparently now been updated to do these emojis, which is even cooler. Because that's the kind of features that you demand uh, in your operating system, isn't it? Now, speaking of little tiny experiences and things that, uh, that get better with time, I really like the new project dialog. This is brand new. I can go and search on language, platform, project type. They've made that new project dialog just that much easier for you to get to. And then once you go and do stuff a couple of times, it will actually go and populate your recent project templates. So there's four or five projects that you usually use. After a week or two, those are going to populate, and you've got your most recently used list of project templates, which is really nice. Now, I talked a little bit about that terminal window, which is an extension, but I also noticed that there was a while there where I was searching for you know, the developer command prompt. The developer command prompt. It's basically DOS, but not DOS with paths set up for you to get MS Build, right? It's, it's, the, it's the DOS prompt that gives you the path stuff that you want. But it's 2019. Where's our PowerShell developer command prompt? So coming in the next preview, developer command prompt for PowerShell done as a module. So you can finally get all those pathing things that's a little bit of an annoyance that always bothered me about 2019. And I said, hey, can you do that for us? They're actually going to ship that. So developer command prompt for Visual Studio. Yay, small things. It, it is the little things that I love. Now, let me go over to Visual Studio and look for a different project. One of the things that I want to see, da, 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 here we go, .NET Core uh, 3. This is .NET Core 3. Let's you run applications that are WinForms apps web and uh, WPF apps. And you, and you might say, well, why would you want to do that, right? You want to do that so that application can become more portable. You want to be able to do that so that application can take advantage of features that aren't going to be in the .NET framework. .NET Framework 4.8 is done, right? It's finished, and it's going to be reliable for the next several decades. But it doesn't have the new hotness. It doesn't have the new features. It's not going to get the new C-sharp isms. Additionally, you've all had this experience at work where someone's on .NET 4 in production, and you did something in .NET 4.7 or 4.8, and you really want to have them upgrade that machine, and they just don't really want to do that. So then you have a situation where you might have all these machines in your fleet, in your group of applications, and you know, these 3,000 people in the home office, they're all running that version of .NET. We can't deploy our app because they're not ready. Next year, when they update Windows, they'll get another version of .NET. We don't want people to feel like that. We want people to get all the great new features in .NET Core today. So we, of course, we make .NET Core 3 work, where you can basically swap the brain out of .NET and .NET Web Form, WinForms, rather, or WPF, now have .NET Core 3 at its heart. 
So we thought it'd be really interesting to go and take uh, an open source project like GreenShot, very popular, very complicated project. Like GreenShot has a lot going on. So the GreenShot folks have gone and take their screenshotting utility application based on, I believe, WinForms and putting .NET Core underneath it. And then what I've done is I've made a right-click publish, and I've made a couple of changes. So here we've got a publish to a folder, right? Right-click, publish, and then your bin debug or your bin release ends up making an executable, and you put it over somewhere. Traditionally, you're used to making an executable and then making sure it runs on a machine by ensuring that that machine has .NET on it. Do you have .NET 4.6? Oh, shoot, I use 4.7. You need to upgrade. That kind of an experience for desktop apps has been frustrating. What we've gone and done here is said, all right, I'm going to go ahead and have a release version of GreenShot running and targeting .NET Core app in the Win x64 namespace. And we're going to put it into a specific location. I'm going to take that. Let's go into that folder right now. So here is that application and all the stuff that it needs. That looks pretty typical. But if we scroll down, what we're actually seeing is .NET. We've copied .NET over, and now there's a folder with all dependencies. That is a self-contained installation of this you know, many years old application, actively, actively worked on. It's a popular application, but it's been around a while. You've got right there WinForms, XML. You've got a lot of stuff going on. But you might say, well, how much .NET did you copy over? That might be a lot. I don't want that much .NET. Well, right there, that's .NET Core 3 copied over, and that's about 160 megs for a very sophisticated application. It's got a lot going on. But you might still say, you know, that's still too much. I don't like that. One of the things that we're working on that will be happening in the future is this on idea of tree trimming. Okay? What if you take that application and you hold it up in the air and you imagine all the functions and all the dependencies and all the stuff that it does, and you give it a good solid shake, and the functions that it doesn't call fall away? And if you can delete all the functions until they're not even needed anymore, maybe those DLLs don't even need to be shipped. So if you're not doing any system.xml, you give it a good shake, system.xml falls away, and suddenly your 100 megabyte app, your 160 meg app is a 100 meg app or a 50 meg app. It depends on how sophisticated it is. I've been able to get .NET Core applications down to the 30, 40 meg range and running very, very small in containers, which is really important for density, for high density scenarios. But additionally, you might be frustrated that this has got a lot of files. And you say, that's a, that's a lot. Now, I think you shouldn't complain because this is pretty amazing. But how far could we take it? Well, what if we did some really interesting stuff? And this is all either coming soon or something to think about. Okay, In here, do, 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 where did it go? I think I put it in properties, publish profiles, super magic, holy crap. <laughs> Let's go and look in that folder. T turns out that if you name a profile that, it actually names the folder that. So there's my application. One executable. One executable. Handled. You like that? hey, I've got a .NET application. I'd like you to go and run on your machine. You pull out your USB key, you stick it in there, and then, of course, they should think about viruses and all that kind of stuff. You delete their hard drive, and you're like, yeah, .NET. Um, and it runs. And it runs because it just runs. It has everything that it needs. Now, it's very early times, but it's something that we're actively working on that you're going to expect to see in the .NET 3 time frame. It's going to get better in preview, four, preview 5, preview 6. As we move forward, the tree trimming thing is coming in the future, but this is part of the unification of the technologies. The tree trimming technology came from the mono world. This is a, win, a .NET Framework application, and now mono, .NET Core, and .NET Framework are coming together, and we take the best bits from each one the interpreter, the ahead of time comp compilation for native, the, the best in class jitter, and you pick the one that makes you happy. Wouldn't that be nice to have a single executable app that just worked and you didn't have to worry about dependencies? We're trying to make that happen for you, and I hopefully think you will appreciate it. That's real, and if I go and run GreenShot, 
right now. Now, there it is, running in the corner. And you can see it. Look at that copyright date. This application, oops, that application has been working on for a long, apparently has absolutely no warranty. So make sure you're aware of that. But also support open source projects and people that work on stuff like this. This is pretty exciting for us to go and be able to do something like that. That is real and happening now. So check that out and feel good about it. Let's switch over to the slides. We have talked about a number of these things. We talked about Visual Studio 2019 and all the great new stuff that's going on. Remember, you can always go to visualstudio.com slash free if you like doing open source. You want a copy of Visual Studio Community, which is great for open source folks. It lets you have extensions and all the power of Visual Studio for little businesses and open source folks. .NET 5, we talked a little bit about in uh, Scott Hunter's thing, the next version of .NET will be numbered 5 because 5 is greater than 4.8. But seriously, the reason that that's important, some people might say it should have been called 4, some of them should have said other things. This is the culmination of all the best of the .NET framework, WinForms, WPF. It's all the great work we've done on .NET Core. It's all the great work that's happening on Mono. And we want to make it a number that's big enough to let both people know the .NET framework people who are on 4.8, it's time to move to 5. The people that are working on .NET Core to move to 5 as well because they can do their, their WinForms and their WPF apps. We can do our ASP.NET Core applications. This is the future. It's going to happen you know, later, 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 a couple years. But we've got the roadmap published now. I encourage you to check out the .NET blog for all that information. Um, it's a good time to be a .NET developer. And right now, .NET Core 3 Preview 5 with both the Windows desktop support, flexible deployment, the ability to do things uh, self-contained or not, runs great in uh, containers. Lots of fun stuff going on right there. And I'm going to do this. Let's talk about happiness, developer happiness. Is this the wrong slide? It is. I'm going to fast forward a little bit and figure out where that went. Let's do this instead. I got confused. Let's bring out Maria to show us some of the fun stuff that we're doing about workshops. Where are you at, Maria? Hi. Hi. All right. Let's do some damage. OK. Right. Big hand for Maria. All right. So you do a lot of workshops. We do a lot of workshops. We teach people how to write code. A lot. And going and saying, Let's install Visual Studio can be overwhelming when they're used to other things. Absolutely. And to challenge that, we created a brand new global tool called .NET Try. Mm. And I want to show you that to you today. So you already have that installed in your machine, okay. and you cloned a GitHub repo, correct? Okay. So let's look at this. So I'm at the command line, and when I type .NET, I get a bunch of commands, like .NET dash dash help. These are all commands. Yeah. You've given me a new command in the form of a global tool. Exactly. OK. And so the only thing I did is install .NET and your, your command. Yes. That's it. And clone the repo that you want to try out. OK. So this is your repo, yep. uh, TDN samples, try.NET samples. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So I want you to type .NET try. .NET try. And what this is going to do, it's going to start up Kestrel and load up a browser. OK. So the browser that we're in now is an interactive experience. Mm. So if you click on one of the samples that we have at the below. Well, hang on. I'm confused, though. I want to, I want to know what's going on here. Oh, this is not. Good catch. Why does this not say ASP.NET? Because it's, we're running a markdown file. You're running a markdown file. Yeah. OK. So if I go back to the command line here, I see readme.md. That is what you just launched, my readme file. I just launched your readme file. That's the readme file that we cloned. Exactly. Ooh. Yeah, this is getting interesting. <laughs> OK. So, so what do you want me to do? Right, so click on Introductions to C Sharp. OK. Introduction to C Sharp. I'm interested also that the path has changed. I'm actually kind of running this all locally on my machine. All locally on your machine. OK. All right. Intro to programming. So run the code. Dun, 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 dun. And I assume that was the power of the cloud? No. It was the power of .NET on your machine. <laughs> okay. So what we're doing here is that we're treating the browser as an editor. Okay. And we're using the try.NET engine to actually create those kind of experiences. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So there's a client server thing going on here. This is my editor, not Visual Studio in this yeah. case. And when I hit run, I compiled it myself. Like yes, the, you did. You did it for me on my I behalf. did it. Exactly. All right. And the big question that people always ask is, how are we doing this? I want to understand. You want to understand? So I want you to go back to your command line, and we're going to open this up in Visual Studio Code. OK, so, so I'm going to stop that, and I'll say code dot. 
and then we'll make sure we're running again. I'll just run it again. I should have had two command lines open. All right, these fonts are huge. I know. Okay, okay. let me make that better. Yeah, so let's start with the methods.md. Okay, so this is a markdown file. Like I a markdown file it. that people would typically write. Okay. But what you're going to notice is that inside the code fences using chai.net, we've actually extended the options. Code fences, what's that? So the code fence is where you see the triple tick CS. OK, so that's Markdown that I recognize, because we use that for writing blog posts. Yeah. You went tick, 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 C sharp? C sharp. And there's some C sharp. And there's some C sharp. All right. But what I want you to pay attention to is you've noticed that there's something different, like mm -hmm. something that doesn't look like regular Markdown. Well, that's all extra looking stuff. It's extra looking stuff. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing here is that we're pointing to a region in a C sharp project mm. called Methods. All right. It's in a particular source file. Which it looks like it's relative to where I'm at. So that must have come down when I cloned when the repo. When you cloned the repo. All right. And then we have the project that will pull down all the assemblies. OK. So what, if we go over to program.cs, right. which program is over .cs. here. Yes, ma'am. All right, there we go. And you will notice that we have a methods region. Yeah. And we have a bit of code. So what we're doing with try.net is that we're accessing your backing project and may allowing you to run it within Markdown. This allows for your backing project to be the source of truth, because a lot of time when people are building workshops, either the Markdown is up to date or the project is up to date. That's interesting you say that, because my question was, was like, well, you know, that's cute to have two lines of code there, but I, that's not going to go very far. I need a project to do a lot of interesting work. That's so you're saying that this isn't the source of truth. No, that isn't That's the not being run. That is not being run. This is being run. So let's change that to something else, tacos. Like change. Uh, hello, tacos. Exactly. Tacos, tacos. Actually, tacos. I'll make them, yeah. OK, so I'm changing this code here. Yeah. yeah. To... And go back to the project. OK. And if we, I you still it have in, it running. Uh, yeah, it was in methods, right? Yes. Do, 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 where is methods? We can go, Actually, hello can I, can I do this? Yeah. OK, so there's, that's interesting. So the, the home page gave me a list of my web server, which is my local folder. And there's the classes and Everything stuff. Everything you need. All right, cool. There you have. Look at that. You run it. But we also want to make sure that we give people the flexibility to actually change the code as they want. So change that from two upper to two lower. Okay. And you're going to also get IntelliSense, too. Yo. Providing people with a real world experience that they'd expect when they're running in an editor, for example. This is really cool. So think about this for a second, folks. You're out there and you want to teach .NET to somebody. You say, all right, everybody, we do a Git clone, a .NET try, and we can learn programming. And then we, send, we give them kind of a gentle on-ramp to Visual Studio, as opposed to the download Visual Studio first <laughs> yes. kind of thing, and then reboot, and then wait till tomorrow or whatever. And we're also seeing this huge trend in interactive documentation as well, which we're able to provide. Interesting. OK, so I've already got a readme.md in my project. There's no reason that I can't use a code fence yes. and add those features. And then my docs themselves could become interactive. Absolutely. I dig it. How complicated can this get? It looks like I can do all kinds of interesting stuff. You can stuff. do all kinds of interesting stuff. OK, right. so we've got loops and whatever. I could probably bring in other packages and stuff as well. Absolutely. This is local, though. This is all local. But what if you wanted to take your markdown and make it into a website? So the documentation would be then interactive. And then you just host it on Azure. And we actually have an experience of that. OK. So then this right here, interactive.net, is this the same thing? It's the same thing. And we have a tool coming up within .NET Try that will be .NET Try Publish. And we will spin up a bunch of HTML for you. OK. So then this is the power of the cloud. This is the power of the cloud with the help of Blazor. Ah, so when I hit run hello world, even though it's hosted here, the work happened in my own browser. In your browser. OK, so I'm not calling out to some other service. This didn't cost me any money other than the website itself. Exactly. And you can see that by going to your developer tools. OK. F12, All right. network. So if you notice over in console for starters. All right, sorry. You wow. see that WASM is initialized. OK, so there's my web assembly right there. Yeah. And then if we look at network, I can see my DLLs that are brought down. So I'm running .NET in the browser. So the power of Blazor, except you applied it to workshops. Exactly. This is cool. So workshops, interactive documentation. Now, interactive documentation would be sweet, but I, I don't usually do interactive documentation. I just yeah. get the NuGet package, make a console app, and I mess around a bit. And I go, ah, it looks fine. And exactly. that's how I pick my NuGet packages. And I think that's the way most people do. Okay. But we've been experimenting with the NuGet team on what if you could just run it in the browser. 
Okay, this is just an experiment. Just an experiment. We need your feedback. You can go in at Maria on Twitter, or at me, at my boss, if you wanted to theoretically do that. Yeah, like my boss, yeah, yeah time. Okay. And uh, okay, so cool. So what is this? So that is uh, JSON.net. Okay, on the new on a NuGet website. On a NuGet website that looks like every other NuGet page, but I want you to scroll down. Mm. And we have an editor right in the browser. So I could go and have a playground, a workshop playground, and go and, uh, and go to NuGet, maybe get there on the home page, click playground, and then try different NuGet packages. Exactly. What do you think about that? <laughs> now, we, we, we cannot stress enough that the NuGet aspect of this is just an experiment. Like, you pulled just this together experiment. last week, right? Yes. OK. So yeah, she's like, yeah. Yeah, we did. But, so it could be done in any number of ways, right? We had to think about that. Well, we, we definitely need feedback. People want to know about whether this is a good idea, if you want this or not. Exactly. And okay. the best way to provide us feedback is to go, go to our GitHub repo. Now, is this the right URL? For our GitHub repo, no. What is that? That is, uh, that's the interactive. That's the interactive thing. experience that people can go and try okay. right now. Let's see where your, your repo is. Dot net, yeah, there it is. Dot net, github slash dot net slash, oops, ah, slash try. Yes, and this is where you can give us feedback. At the end of the week, we hope to have the dot net try global tool available for people to start using. Very cool, so I'm gonna blog about this. I'm gonna make it so you can try the tool, but what I wanna see you do, make workshops. Make interactive documentation. What can you do with something like this yourself? Yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much, Maria, Hi. and your team. This is great. Thank you, Scott. Yay! <laughs> what is something? What, what a great example of .NET Everywhere. Like this is what I want you all to think about. The idea that I could go and do a workshop with all of you, and we could all do it interactively, and say. Dot .NET try, and then we play, and then we get Visual Studio Code, and we move our way off into there. But the documentation would be local. You could even imagine that documentation living inside Visual Studio Code. It's really, really cool. You can also see pieces of .NET try and their teams work on the docs. If you go to docs, sometimes you'll find a .NET try enabled page. It's pretty exciting stuff. So one of the other things I wanted to show is, speaking of .NET everywhere, this is my low rent solution. They wanted to charge me money for a guy with a camera, so I figured I would just bring this thing here. Uh, what are some other cool places that .NET sh could show up? So I work with my friends over in, da -da -da -da, I'm turning this on, just look at this here, tiny keyboard. Pause for effect. Still pausing for the effect. Mm. Try getting through security with this, friends. <laughs> What is that, sir? Oh, it's nothing. It's fine. It's fine. Don't pay no attention to that thing that I've got there. This is a fun thing. This is actually a uh, really cheap tripod. Um, all right. This is called a crow pie. C-R-O-W-P-I. It's just a thing I bought on Amazon. It's a great little company that makes these. And what you're looking at is a Raspberry Pi on the left-hand side there that has been basically stuck to a playground of fun stuff. You've got your GPIO pins up here, and you can see that they light up, telling you that this button is connected to that pin. And since .NET runs everywhere, we wanted to see how far we could take it. Now, you know that well, maybe you don't know. Do you know that we have system.devices.gpio, general purpose IO? The .NET 3 has got a lot of fun stuff happening in um, the GPIO space. Check this out. I'm going to go ahead and just run a .NET application on the Raspberry Pi. There's our smiley face. But more importantly, yum tacos. <laughs> yum tacos. Thank you, I'm glad. That's all it takes to get applause from you all, just mention tacos. So one of the things that's exciting about that is the community around it. Check this out. This is at the .NET GitHub repository, .NET slash IoT. And these are the devices that they're currently working on. Look at all these great devices. It's a really, really active community of people that are going and bringing things in. If you find a part from Adafruit or our friends at SparkFun and you get one of these parts working, you can go and read the spec sheet and go and write a driver, in quotes, a driver for it. And then look at this. System.device, rotating, 
Then there's the smiley face. You have to kind of squint to see the smiley face, but you get the idea. This is low-level code. This is the kind of stuff you usually expect to be doing in an Arduino type of a situation. We've got .NET Core running really great on a Raspberry Pi, which has allowed me to do all kinds of fun projects, make ASP.NET microservices, automate my house with, uh, with .NET. There was even a really cool DNS server called, I think it was Tectanium, that I wrote about in my blog. It's an entire low-level DNS server, and it runs on a Raspberry Pi. With something like a Crow Pi, which is a really fun tool for learning and for STEM, you can go and play with .NET, even if you aren't thinking of yourself as being a low-level IoT person. And we got to play with the matrix display. We've got the LEDs working. It's really, really exciting. Whoops. Whoop. Really, really exciting and fun stuff. And it's all real, real and really blurry. It's really blurry. Trust me, it works. It's a real demo. I would encourage you to check that out and get involved. It is make, making me very, very happy. These are the little things, the little things, to have IoT and .NET Core uh, merge together. And I lost the clicker thing. It's probably one of those situations where the glasses are on my face. All right, developer happiness. Let's go with developer happiness. Little things that make me happy. Where is Rich Turner? Where are you, sir? Come here. Rich is like, what do you expect from me? Just yeah. smile and look pretty, all right? So I have been hanging out here. You saw Maria just left, and yes. Maria and I were at the command line. I love the command line. I spend a lot of time at the command line. I think that Windows is great, but we're missing the boat when it comes to command line totally technology. Yep. It's awesome stuff having the command line. So yes, the year is the future. Yes, it's the dream of the 90s. It's alive Absolutely. in Portland. So. Explain to me why this is a suboptimal uh, situation and why you could make it better. Switch. Oh, switch? Darn you, computer. So the this command is the line. Windows command line that we all know and <coughs> love. Um, it's a rather old application. It's actually been in Windows since the dark ages. And one of the big problems with the console is its primary goal is backward compatibility. So every time we change something, that's its primary goal. Break don't something. break. Yeah, don't, no. It, it was originally introduced into NT to run MS DOS scripts. Ooh. Anybody ran on MS DOS? Yeah, Greybeards, let me. Yeah, yeah. Dot bat. Dot bat. Yep. Yeah. Deploy it was dot the bat, future. Right? Yeah, it, it is. was in the future. Very exciting. Um, so this was essentially introduced to Windows to run MS DOS batch scripts, and it's still in broad use today. We think we can do a bit better. Yeah. So what you did is you made this yummy thing. I'm going to go and say DOS but not DOS. DOS but not DOS. Yeah, that's, should, what, I, I, that's, what, I, that. that's what I called it. We'll come back to that in a second. So yeah. this is uh, DOS but not DOS. Yes, uh, CMD. Yeah, and I can go and do something like that. Yeah. And that's fast. It's pretty quick, right? That is fast. It's drawing on your GPU now. Seriously? Yeah, finally. This is GPU-enabled DOS? GPU you saw it DOS. here first, people. Absolutely. A right. thousand frames a second. So Windows Console draws on your CPU. Seriously? Which means if you minimize your Windows console windows, your build will run quicker, which is great. Because it you gives know, you it's back funny. your CPU cycle. I suspected that. Right? I knew, I knew that when I run a batch file, I would minimize it. Or I would Absolutely. do even worse. This is so bad. I would go and run stuff like this. And I go, you know, that feels slow. Yeah. So I go like this. Watch. And you shrink it down, we draw less. So it takes less CPU. And I'm like, is it done? Yeah, it's done. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's still going, actually. Yeah. So give yourself 3% faster builds, minimize the console. But not right. anymore. Not anymore. Okay. Because now we're drawing on your CPU. Okay. On your GPU, sorry. On your GPU. Yeah. Okay, cool. So this is an attractive thing, and I noticed this right away because I tried it right away. Mm. I held down control and I scrolled. This was the Ooh. first thing I beat the team up when I joined to say, can you make the text do the zoomy thing? Because my eyes are starting to pop yeah. up. And then, because I always try every other thing, I you hit have control, to keys, right? control, shift, windows, alt, scroll. With your elbow. With yeah. Your, oh, yeah. Check this out. Oops. Do, do, do. That's not the wrong. Ah. Do, do, yep. do, 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 do. What's happening? So you'll see, it might be more difficult to see on the big screen, but the blur and the transparency are adjusting. You can see my icons. And I'm going to make it go back the other way. That's control shift scroll. Yeah. I think that's pretty fun. And yeah. someone's like, why did you do that? Well, why not? Because we could. Because you could. <laughs> so now we're on the GPU. Now we're drawing everything using GPU and DirectX and Direct Write and so on. Now we can do fun things like blurry backgrounds. This is a modern terminal. It's a modern terminal. Very so modern terminal. How will this be distributed? So we're currently with the, the, the other thing about this is that it's currently open source. We just open sourced it this morning. We literally pushed the code during Kevin's keynote, which is nice. a little bit nervy on conference Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, but it worked. So the code is out there. You can download and clone the code today. You can build it and run it locally. 
We're just sorting out a few things with our automated CI system, which will then see the, uh, the Windows terminal available via the Windows Store for you to download as a preview self-host. Mm -hmm. And then we're aiming to get this out into V1 kind of state toward the end of the year if we can. OK, so I wanted to see how far I could take it. So I'm mm. doing a number of things that I wasn't sure if they were allowed. First, there's a profile.json settings thing. And you can go in there. And I just made a bunch of icons Absolutely. and made a bunch of profiles. What do, you, what do you show the audience where you set those things up? Because yeah. these you define yourself. We'll ship so a few by I default. I hit settings. And I went in here. And I'll go ahead and format that. And these yeah. are not only my settings, but my color schemes. I like a vintage cursor. And well, then I'm even using, coming soon, uh, a new font that they're looking at Absolutely. possibly doing. A new yeah, we've been working Cascadia. with the font team and a very talented font designer to come up with a new freshened command line font, yeah. or fixed width font. So it will work in VS Code Which and is Visual yummy. Studio as well. And then check this out. Look at this. I made an Ubuntu Legit. Ubuntu Legit. Yeah. We should trademark that as well. That is the Ubuntu Legit yeah. profile. So then if I go here and I say DOS but not DOS, that's the new font. Right. If I say Visual Studio 2019 PowerShell, this will be PowerShell with the, I think that's Consolas. Consolas or, yeah. And then I hit Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Check this out. <gasps> what? Powerline, finally. Right? Powerline support. So what's that about? I can go like mount, if I know how to type when no one's looking. Yes. MNT. Everyone has to look away. Oh, MNT, sorry. Yes. I got confused. So there's GitHub. your Windows file system in Linux. And we'll talk more about that in a second. It's fun. OK, so there's, there's that. I think I've angered the beast. Oh, dear. What have you done now? I think I, I'm still working on getting my blood sugar thing to work. Right, so maybe that's warning you. There's some challenges there. I'm probably going to die in a second. So you take I'll catch you. You go and take over. I can control W yeah. and close the windows, yes. which is pretty cool. We've got cool. a few glitches there. The, the last one won't completely terminate the app, but we, we've got to fix it. No, it's fine. Way. I mean, it's zero point whatever. This, is, this is really early code. Well, so, um, so I early. Was, I wanted to do you. this. Check this out. I thought it would be interesting to go and mess with them. So I put a bunch of emoji right. into, a, um, into a loop. So I wanted to see what would happen. So now, .NET, people are looking. It makes me nervous. <laughs> .NET run, watch the left-hand side. Emoji madness. Animating emojis Animating in your command line. So right? then I showed Animojis. Michael, I showed Michael Crump, and he was like, well, wait a second. How far can I take this? So Michael decided to write a Pong application in .NET using emoji. <laughs> The future is yesterday. The right? future is yesterday. So I'm pretty excited about getting my BBS door games working on Absolutely. Windows again. So that's pretty exciting. Another thing I did from an experimental perspective is I went and I had someone do this. You know how you can go to shell.azure.com and they'll go and make you something? What if you brought that to the command line? I could say new cloud shell. This is an experiment. It's open source. It was done by a very kind engineer on the team. Uh, but now I'm saying connecting to terminal, uh, but I'm in your terminal because I used your integration points. Absolutely. And now I'm in Azure. Yes at the command line. I didn't SSH in. Yep. This isn't that. This is a creating of a um, of a Azure container instance within the free shell.azure.com shell right. terminal. I've got my, my, my cloud drive right there. I can go and do whatever I want to do. And then close that and shut it down. It's pretty fantastic. Now, it is. one of the things I wanted to show about Ubuntu, though, was we had some negative feedback in the past about WSL. Uh, for real hardcore workers. This, ge this gentleman here, my good friend Sam Saffron, was disappointed with the perf because he was trying to run Postgres, Reddit, Docker, uh, Ruby. Ruby, and bring up all of their very sophisticated application Absolutely. discourse. It's a big app, yeah. So he tweeted that he was not super thrilled with that. And he said, I can't believe the tax that I've paid over the years. And he basically did this sophisticated bit of, uh, of work to Absolutely. figure out whether this was a good deal. And uh, what was it about WSL1 that was preventing him from being happy? So the big performance challenge with WS1, WSL1 is disk I.O. Um, in terms of general performance, WSL is about as performant as Linux on the same tin in terms of CPU and GPU and so on. But in terms of disk access, we really struggled with WSL1. Mm. So we thought we might spend a bit of time trying to fix that. So how did you fix that? So in WSL2 that was also announced just this morning, we essentially uh, stand up a Linux kernel instance in a VM. Mm -hmm. And we run containers on top of that VM in which we run your Linux distros. 
Okay, but I can make a VM now. You can. And I don't really sweat it. Like, I'm like, ah, oh, that's too much pressure. Absolutely. Um, but that VM tends to be the sort of isolated box over here that doesn't yep. integrate with your desktop at all. You're, you can't see its files yeah, from your Windows environment. It takes a while to load. It, it takes, big, a it takes to minutes load. to load. Absolutely. So if you just close down that Ubuntu window for a second. Well, I can't. It's doing a giant build Oh, it's right doing now. a giant build. Oh, but but when I open one. the other one, it yeah, takes, how long one. does it take? Uh, do, 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 one, 1,000. So that's about two seconds to boot a kernel instance and stand up a new user mode instance, one on top of the other. Uh, from scratch. You know something interesting? I put my code that I'm actually running right now, my Ruby code for him, in, in Discourse. If you look right. here, it's in Home Scott Discourse. But check this out, explorer.exe. And this is where the different, big difference between WSL and a separate environment in the VM is, is the integration between your local desktop experience and the Linux experience in WSL. We try and grease that wheel and try and make that smooth and as easy to use as possible. Mm -hmm. So rather than having these two completely isolated environments, we have them be able to communicate. Does that mean that you spent a very great deal of time <laughs> telling me not to do this? You yes. said, don't open these files, don't play in here. We said, don't go spelunking through the file system and try and access through the back door. But can I open my profile in but VS Code? But now you can, yes. So I'm going to so, right click and open my profile. There you go. And there it is. That's my Bash profile. Yeah. So we've essentially added a file server to the WSL side of things, a file server client to the Windows side of things, and allowing you now to access the files that are in your WSL instance as if they were being shared via a file server. And now you can access those files from VS Code, from Visual Studio, from Sublime, Vim, Emacs, whatever it is that you use to edit code. Mm -hmm. So in this case here, I went and I think this will work. I think it's on port 3000. And this should be, let's go back over here. I, f I fired up, uh, let's see, is he running on 4000? I fired up Redis, Postgres SQL. Basically, let me rephrase. You know what I did? I did, I went to Discourse, and I went to the Beginner's Guide to Discourse. Absolutely. And one of the things that I've always been sad about is that I, I'm using Windows, I love Windows, I go to a website, and then they, I see a dollar sign to indicate the prompt, yep. and I think it's not for me. Not for like, me. It's like, until now. So I literally followed this guide. I went right. into the Windows Store. I downloaded Ubuntu, or you can get, you know, Penguin Linux or yep. peng, peng, what's it called? Peng, peng, penguin. Penguin. Yep. I can get um, OpenSUSE or whatever, and I just follow the instructions. And literally, I did nothing different. Absolutely. And because it, you're running Linux. On the Windows on desktop. On Linux kernel. Hmm? In a VM with containers and all magic to make it all work, but ultimately, you're running Linux on Windows now. Yep. So we went and told Sam about this, and we did some heroic stuff. Sam's in Australia. <laughs> we might, we might have, uh, <laughs> have had to ship a couple of machines internationally. So what we did is we shipped him a computer yeah. to try it out because he, he was upset, and we wanted to make yeah. him happy. And he said the boot speed of WSL2 is nothing short of spectacular. Double click on the Ubuntu icon, and within a second, it's up from a cold run post-reboot. Yeah. This is not fire up a VM and SSH no. into it. And wait for 15, totally 20 seconds integrated. for it to start, and then log in, and wait for it to boot to the desktop and all that stuff. Right. And, and if you know Sam, you know that he doesn't give compliments lightly. Yes. Best in class option for Windows. So if you want to do anything with Discourse or Ruby or any of these languages. Or anything with any Nix tools or build environments, build scripts, debug scripts, test, test systems, all manner of stuff. Yep. So I just followed those instructions, and that worked really, really well. Um, and the perf is, uh, is comparable to running on a virtual machine. Very comparable to running on a virtual machine, which yes. is approaching native, obviously not quite as fast right. in some cases. He did say that if you install Linux on the metal, yes. then you'll get more perf. Yes. But what kind of perf are we talking about? Is it twice as fast? So we're seeing, uh, depending upon what you're running and how disk intensive it is, if you've got something that's extremely disk intensive, we're seeing between 7 and 10 times faster. 7 on and 10 times faster. Yeah. That's hot. All right, last thing I want to show you is what's going on over here. Do you we remember the old days when we used to ship power tools? Yes, power remember tools. Those? Experiments much like this talk. Much like this talk. Stuff that we don't have permission to ship. Switch. Switch. Darn you. <sighs> Why aren't on, you Scott, up you here pushing buttons? You should be good at this buttons? by now. <laughs> remember, what's this? Thank you, by the way. It's the first of some of the power tools that we're starting to create. I've always felt it was frustrating that I couldn't maximize something onto yeah. another virtual, virtual desktop. desktop. Virtual desktops for me are, are one of the hidden gems of Windows. They're yeah. not exposed visually that well, 
but it's so powerful to be able to have a desktop where you might have Outlook and some Word docs that you're working on, and then a separate desktop where you've laid out all your dev tools, your editor, your debugger, whatever you've got, another window where you've maybe got some tests and some builds running, yep. and be able to flick between them with a mere four-finger swipe across your taskbar. Right. Tra trackpad. Other people on competitive situations have had this experience for many years, Absolutely. so why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we? Why should we do without? So what we're when doing we do is with. we're bringing power, to, power tools back. Yep. We're breaking all kinds of rules. One and of they're my, open source. They are open source. One of my favorite ones was I ended up holding down um, the Windows key <laughs> too long. Ever wondered how to access the shortcuts that make you productive on Windows? Wouldn't it be great if we could actually Look show you Look at the numbering along the bottom there, reminding us to go Windows 1, Windows 2. This is actually contextual as well. You notice that the window controls on the left says no action because this is actually full screen, but if I go like that, now the window controls say maximize. Yeah. So imagine thing. how nice that's going to be for a non-technical parent to be able to figure that out as well. Yes. Pretty cool stuff happening Super right now. Kids, right? Windows Power Tools. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate All that. Right. Thank you. So what's new? Windows Terminal. It's happening. All the things that you can imagine are probably going to happen, and if they don't, they'll have some kind of an extensibility model, so you'll be able to make it happen. I was already goofing around recently, so I could make right-click Windows Terminal here. If you go Windows R and type WT, that's Windows Terminal. Uh, it's early, but it's really, really exciting. WSL2 coming soon, near 100% compatibility with native Linux, and it is fast, fast, fast. They are literally shipping a Linux kernel in Windows now, and it's optimized for WSL, and it works really great. And the memory usage is really, really great compared to a full virtual machine. And then also Power Toys. Power Toys is happening. You can see it at github.com slash Microsoft slash Power Toys open source. And this is just a start. Just that one Power Toys is a start. We're going to think about other ideas, bring other partners and friends in to go in and get involved in that. Now, tacos. Where is Seth Juarez? Right here. Are you here, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, what computer? Are you on another computer? Did you put your computer I in the I am on 14. You're on 14, 14, sir. 14, but I think my, my screensaver might have come on. Is it? Is it? So there you go. There you go. OK. So I'm going to move my move your stuff. My so Scott last so week I'm, was like, hey, you want to write something for me? And I'm like, yeah, I got nothing to do. I wanted you to use the power of the cloud and .NET to solve a huge problem, because I took my buddy. Yeah, and I know this guy, and I can totally vouch that this literally happened. I took my Australian friend. This actually did happen. It happened three days ago. I was with Adam Kogan from Australia. Yeah. He and his daughter, Ruby, came down. And they, they're here, and they, they wanted to try new foods. New foods. So we went to Chipotle. And um, <laughs> I'm going to have to. I know. As a Mexican, I apologize. I feel like. Right. Yeah, my anyway, grandma is very upset right now. I should have got him tacos. I got him a burrito, and now he wants a system to tell him the difference between a taco and a burrito because he doesn't like burritos. He wants, what? He, he never wants to see a burrito again. He's all tacos all the time. Okay. So we need to solve this with machine learning. Okay, so let's do it. Okay. I thought so, we would use ML.net <laughs> if that's okay. Please. So I'm try I got to put into a context that maybe you can understand, right? You're from Portland, right? Yeah. So whenever you're making like your vegan kale salsa for your, you know, <laughs> Your free range chicken tacos. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like yesterday. Yeah, like yesterday. So basically, if you think of machine learning as the blender that takes something inedible like kale, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. And blends it together and makes something useful. Just like because, salsa. Like salsa, right? <laughs> Your vegan kale salsa with turmeric and essential oils, of course, right? So when it, after it makes that, right, then you have something that's useful. Yes. Right? And so imagine machine learning as like kale. I'm imagining it's like the blender, right? Yeah, and then you put that data, which is what our kale is, you put it into the blender, into the blender. and then something good comes out. Okay, so I, I, so I went and got you via uh, uh, away yeah. a whole pile of photographs right. of burritos and tacos. So let's give you an example. All right. So I have here in my training data set some pictures of some burritos. Now right? these are burritos here. Burritos, yes. And on the upper left, that's. <laughs> some burritos here. That is a burro, <laughs> no, it's but a it's really one. small, so burrito. it's burrito. Burrito, right? So basically, this is the kale. 
Yes. This is what you're giving the machine learning algorithm to learn from. You're so saying, it's chewing on these burritos. Yeah, it's chewing on it. You're saying, this is a burrito, and I basically use folders. Yeah. And this, these are tacos. Use okay. these to train it. Now, here's the thing. You're going to even look at pictures this. of tacos, like yeah, drawings pictures. of tacos. Not even drawings. And so yeah, basically, yeah, yeah. if you're a .NET dev and you're looking at this, you're like, I know exactly what this is. Seth is going to give me a folder. Oh, yeah. well, let me zoom out here. So I think I zoomed in too much. That's cool. But like if you he zoom gave in me too a much, folder. I can yeah. deal with two folders. I can. I know that much code that I can write that. So here's a folder, and I basically go into it and I enumerate and I yield return. So it's telling you these are the pictures of the tacos. These pictures of these. All right. So let me show you the actual Blender bits because this is ML.NET and it just hey. went GA. Load right? images. Yeah, so Research basically right here, I'm loading the images, and I'm creating this thing called the data, which is loading data into the ML.NET context, okay. and then the Blender happens in the pipeline. This is the blending. Okay, so you built a custom pipeline. Yes. And every Blender is different. That's right, so every Blender is different. So in this case, this is like really innocuous. It's basically saying when you see the string burrito, map it to a number so I can understand. And you don't have to think about it. But you're not mapping to a number, you're mapping to the name of the folder. Yeah, to the name of the folder, and then it's gonna say, well, I need a number. So that's how the uh, I see. And then this one here says, okay, load the images. This says resize the images. This says extract the pixels. And now because ML.NET is doing shallow learning, which is not bad, it's not like it's- It's not deep learning, it's not it's into just itself. Shallow. It's just like- It's emotionally shallow learning. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Self-centered learning. learning. Yeah. Maybe my jokes are Teenage too Teenage angst right? learning. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. So basically there's certain models that are shallow that learn on the surface of the things, and there's deep learning models. So basically I took a deep learning model from TensorFlow, and I fed the pictures into that as a special custom blender that I brought in, like your ninja. Okay, I like, think that your analogies are breaking down, but okay. please continue. Okay, so this is what this blender looks like, is I want you to see what this looks like. So basically, this is the TensorFlow model that I'm loading, Seriously. and we're looking into the AI right now, so don't look too closely because explosions, right? So basically, it's feeding the pictures into this, and then feeding it all the way down and doing a lot of mathiness. <laughs> Blender. It's simple. It's so easy. You can do it too. You can do it but too. But I don't have to ever look at that, right? No, you don't. Because I only know .NET. I don't Basi want to learn that. Yeah. So basically, it's going to feed the picture through this model, and then we're going to do some ML.NET here. Right? Oh, well, the one line of code, right? Is that literally one line? Yeah, it's basically one line. Oh, goodness. So this is the actual machine learning code. That, because we like the, the I, if, flowy. Hey, if I can copy paste this, me? I am judging you. Okay, so basically we're doing this here and then we're gonna run it. So as it's going, I should have ran it first. But basically it takes about 60 seconds to run this code. It'll take all of the images, like 800 of them. It'll use this thing. And if you're wondering why I'm doing this, it's called transfer learning because basically I'm taking learning from another AI and I'm bolting it into ML.NET. And this takes about like, I don't know, Okay, so are you actually doing the work here or is the cloud doing this? We talked about this a little bit earlier. You, machine learning is one of those things where it can, it's, this is my opinion, yeah. it gets to 80% really fast and then you just have to decide how, how long you want to take to get to 90 plus. Right, so in this case, I'm just running it here because I'm doing transfer learning and it's really easy and it's just going to do it like in 60 seconds. But is it going to be like accurate? Yeah, I mean, I get about like 80, 90% accuracy. It's okay. Okay, that's about as, a, as accurate as so an Australian at Chipotle. So it took 30, so, yeah, about, about as accurate. So notice that these are the data in the Val folder. It's like, yeah, I'm guessing a burrito. Well, a breakfast burrito. Yeah. I mean, really, who, who, who can say so 56%? So I, I wanted to spend a lot of time, you know, because I wanted to build you a really good application to show you this in action. I appreciate that you put work into this yeah, request. Yeah, a lot of work. So I'm going to go ahead and set this as the startup project in Control F5. Like I said, a lot of work went into this demo here. <laughs> You give wind forms to a data scientist, and that's what you get. And basically, now what I need to do is I need to load up the model that okay. I built. Because when I when I did this training, I basically saved the model out to a file. Okay, so the trainer made the model, and the model can then be reused and given to my Just friends. Just think of it like an asset, like a like a like a jar file or an assembly, something that you right. want to run. I dig and it. And now basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the load the model here. So I'll yeah. do tacos model, and now I'm going to load some pictures of images, and it should guess if it's the right one. So That's I'm load to, model. I'm, yeah, so I already load the model. You, you know, you clicked the wrong button. Oh, I clicked the wrong button. I don't okay. want you to fail. Oh, I feel I care like, that much. Okay, okay, so now I'm gonna load the model again to show you that it's super there fast. I'm gonna load a picture, go to Val, I'm gonna pick a, a taco, and it's gonna look at it and say, you know what, Seth, I think that's, those are tacos. They are tacos. And then I'm gonna go here to load a picture and do a burrito here and see that it's load burrito. Now you're probably thinking that this is really hard code. But like I said, I spent a lot of time working on this for you because, again, you called me last week. <laughs> I just thought it was a cool idea for a I know, right? So to load the model, it's basically... Hang on. Uh, ML context, model.load, create prediction engine. That's it. And once you, you say I'm mapping... That's it. That you didn't hide it in some no. giant file no, so, CS. No, image That's data it. is like the, the thing I'm mapping from, and then this is the thing I'm mapping to, and then when I'm loading it, 
Uh, when I'm using the actual model, I do this transformation here on line 32, engine.predict, new image data, that's it. I dig it. So that's pretty cool. And to be clear, you used ml.net, yes, which sir. we announced and we know is available today. That's right. Open source, cross-platform. Right. You can reuse your skills. That's right. You can use TensorFlow models, yeah. shallow learning, deep yeah, learning, yeah. all the learnings. You can use the learnings. All the learnings. That's and right. then we also saw Scott Hunter show the model builder, which is a simple UI tool yep. to jump jumpstart this process. It's really cool. I love it a lot. And next time, give me a little bit more advanced time. I will see you later for tacos. Take care, buddy. Thank you, sir. All right. Now. As as with all demos and, and as with all things, I don't know if things are going to work and I don't know if things are a good idea, but one of the things that I wanted to try, because I appreciate you, the people, is I wanted to see what kind of damage we could do with .NET really everywhere. When I say .NET everywhere, I don't mean necessarily Raspberry Pis, I don't mean necessarily ML, I mean everywhere. Like, you know, that guy in The Professional, like Gary Oldman. I, I need, like, a gif of me saying everywhere. So I called my friends at Misty Robotics to see what kind of trouble we could get into with a robot named, named Misty. Do you want to help me out here? Oh, here, why don't you, oh, hello, friend. Hello, you can, you can help me if you want to come out and help me not, not break it. Check this out, this is Misty from Misty Robotics. How are you, sir? I know you're nervous that I'm gonna drop her, aren't you? Yeah, you're afraid, right? He's like, don't, don't anger her. She's fine, right? Yeah, don't be angry. So what I wanted to do is Misty runs Windows IoT Core, and I've got my low-rent camera here that's Misty-sized. Let's see if this actually fits. I don't think I actually practiced to see if it goes that far. Hello. And I thought if I was going to do tacos that I need a Diet Coke. So I need to train the robot with .NET Core to teach me Diet Teach me to teach it to bring me a Diet Coke. So there we go. Let's look at that. So hey, uh, Misty, can I have a Diet Coke? It's adorable. Hi, Scott. Good to see you. I got you the usual. The usual in the form of Diet Coke. There's my butt on a giant screen. <laughs> So Misty can connect to the internet. Misty can take pictures. Say cheese. Can talk to Azure Cognitive Services. Tell me stuff about myself. Can you take something? A blurry image of a man. There you go. <laughs> I've usually been described as a blurry image of a man. <laughs> I, I haven't felt this insulted since I generated some code in Visual Studio and it said, this code is generated by a tool. <laughs> Misty has got Windows IoT Core at her heart. She's got all kinds of abilities to have, and you see that they actually 3D printed me an arm to hold the soda pop. It's a whole platform for having fun with robotics and learning about things in different languages, whether it be Node or in, coming later this summer in .NET. And they sent me some sample code to go and look at that I believe is sitting in here. Build, Misty, hello, Build. And this is so exciting to see .NET everywhere. I like being able to go and take my skills everywhere. So here's an example, right? Talk to the different sensors, register events. Missy's got a whole ton of different events, whether it be face recognitions, bumpers. There's different stuff that you can touch, okay, or not touch. <laughs> she does not like anyone to touch her hair. Um, you can move her around and do all kinds of things. A whole platform to learn about robotics and then apply them. So who knows what one could potentially build with, with Misty. If you see the folks from Misty Robotics running around, be sure to say hi to them. All of this was a wonderful experiment, and I appreciate you spending time with me. We're going to go ahead and put up in a gist at aka.ms slash all the dev things, code and more. It might take a little while to get those things updated. I would encourage you to take a photograph of this slide for some of the related sessions, and be sure to visit the booths. You know that this is a very booth 
Larry Booth Heavy Conference because we want you to talk to the real people that build the real things. We'll bring Misty up front and you can talk to the friends that from Misty Robotics that helped us. We'll have code for the tacos demo. We'll have try.net uh, information coming out Thursday or Friday later this week. If you see myself or Maria walking around, please be sure to give us a chat. Remember, of course, to put your feedback in the thing because my boss reads it. And thank you very much. I appreciate you all. Thanks for hanging out with us today.